Um, hi, I'm Rory. I'm here to talk about starting up startups. So what I'll share today, I'm going to share two things. I'm going to share um, some lessons for starting a startup that I've gained by mentoring approximately 100 startup companies over the last three or four years. And then I'm going to flow into Entry29, which is a co-working space in the city, uh, which I know some of you are, um, are members of. Um, I also know there's some who um, could be members, and it's also of interest to, to many in the room. So with a, with a, a tech startup, the key thing for a startup is making money. Um, if it doesn't make money, then arguably it's, just, it's a hobby. And there's nothing wrong with that, but to provide a, a sustainable future to make, to make an income, then it's important to have a business model behind the, the startup. So one of the things that, um, one of the nice models in Australia is our business model canvas. It's used in a range of different things, but it works particularly well for sketching out a, a startup business. So who in the room seen the business model canvas before? Okay, about 40% or so. I'll just quickly go through it. Um, basically on, the, on the, this side over here, there's this demand side. Over here, there's the supply side, and the business model sits down the bottom here. And what this provides is a one-page one summary to be able to look at the key aspects of an idea. Um, now, I arrived in Canberra about just under two years ago, and what I started doing was going through this model and also another one called the Lean Canvas, and going through with uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, people intending to be an entrepreneur to start a business, and mapping one of these out. We did the sessions in about one hour, and at the end of that session, um, people had a, a, a business model that they could start to work with. What it does is it helps to highlight some of the risks, some of the assumptions that a person has got, and it gets sort of ideas floating around it. If you're more interested in more information on that, there's a, um, I can give you the link to delve into it more. Um, it's, the key thing about this is that within one hour, it's, it's possible to come up with a, a business model for an idea that you've got around a startup. The next one is around the growth engines of a business. So for a, for a, a startup to scale, there needs to be a few, different, few things in place. So the growth engine is how that business scales, how it ramps up, how it accelerates. The first, these growth engines come from Eric Ries, who's the author of the, the Lean Startup. The first one is the paid engine of growth. And what that means is that if you pay $10 for a customer, then that customer makes more than $10. So they might make $11, they might, might make $20. The basis there is that the more money you put in to this uh, paid engine of growth, the more customers that you get and the more money you make. So potentially you get this feedback loop where the profit that you're making off a customer can go back in and then go and acquire one, two, three or four customers. So it becomes a, an exponential growth loop. The second one is a viral engine of growth. So the viral engine of growth is, the first thing around viral is that um, if you think of a cold or a, a flu or something like that, that if it's passed on between, say, you and somebody else or between two people, then it's involuntary. A lot of people try and go out and, and intentionally try and, uh, well, think, think of a network's effect and confuse that with virality. The fact is that virality is something that a product produces as a side effect of what it's doing. So the classic one is Facebook. Somebody joins Facebook and then they notify their friends to join Facebook. Um, every time they post on it, it goes out to people who are their friends or who are connected, and people kind of get infected with this Facebook virus. And through that, they start to engage with the product more, they refer people on, um, they look at more ads, and the, and the business grows very, very quickly. The viral engine of growth was really the key driver of, of uh, Facebook and many of the social networks or businesses with a network effect. And the final one is the stickiness engine of growth. And this is particularly relevant for uh, companies, startups or companies with a lot of invested in their infrastructure. So telcos, for example, enterprise software companies, uh, even infrastructure, um, like built infrastructure. Uh, the stickiness engine of growth is effectively based around the churn rate. And can you get customers in quicker than you're losing them through churn? And if you can, then you're able to, to get them in and, and grow the business because you've got more and more business people um, paying money. So in this basis, it's important to have a recurring revenue model. It's not just one off. So it could be software as a service, platform as a service. It could be through tolls, through memberships. It's important that the customers remain customers on a regular basis. As long as you're not churning through them too quickly, then again, the business will keep growing. Now, as far as measuring this, 
This is, yet, this is another framework. This one's from a guy called Dave McClure of 500 Startups. It's the customer. Um, basically, he's got five key metrics that are important for a startup. So the first one is acquisition. And this is where, do, where people come from. So this is the traffic channels. Um, so is it through social media? Is it through paid advertising, through search, referrals, uh, broadcast media? This is the source of, of uh, the customers. The customers come into the shop, into the, uh, onto the mobile device, onto the website, and they activate. And activate varies depending on the type of business it is. The one I like the most is that they pay some money. And that generates the fifth one, which is revenue. That sort of path right through there is the sort of simplest path. And as far as testing a value proposition, then if you can go and get some people, get them to activate around a value proposition and pay some money, then you can start to validate out a, a, a value proposition quite quickly. The other aspects, referral and retention, uh, become important to, to kind of scale that up, and particularly uh, retention in regards to the, uh, the stickiness engine of growth, and that's about keeping people on board. And then the referral metric is particularly important for the viral engine of growth. So by keeping track of these five metrics, it sort of starts to simplify things. And rather than spending hours looking at something like Google Analytics or KISS Metrics or one of the analytics tools, uh, by looking at the five sort of metrics that matter, it really helps to sort of focus in uh, the effort around growing a business. The next one, know your customer. So this is a little bit design thinking like. The difference between, uh, I guess, the twist with a startup and particularly lean startup compared to design thinking is the fact that there's failure as a real option uh, here, like individual uh, financial failure, that sort of thing. So the first aspect is around how does your customer currently solve the problem that you're intending to solve? A lot of people with startup ideas have, this, have a solution and they want to go out and they want to sell a solution. If you go out and try and do that without understanding the problem that, the, that your customers have, then chances are you'll find that they, they, they aren't buying it and you don't know why. And after trying to, to, to um, uh, push a solution, or particularly after investing a lot of money in developing a solution, you find you don't have customers and the business fails. Particular, very, very risky way to do things. Of course, can you map out how people buy things? So how do people go through and, and uh, what's their problem like? How do they make purchase decisions? So as a consumer, is it an emotion, uh, emotive decision that they're making? Um, are there uh, friends or family who are influencing them? If it's an enterprise decision, how does that work? What's the process in procurement or purchasing? Who makes a decision? Who has to approve it? Who has to look at it? Um, what, what sort of, uh, what, what aspect, what frameworks are in place? Once you understand the problem and how the, the, pro how the product is purchased, then what does this solution look like? Now, the solution isn't just technical or it isn't just product. It can also be around the, what, is it, what does it look like, feel like, smell like, taste like? What are the, what's the emotional response that people have around what's be, what, what you're offering to them? And often, particularly in commodities, it's not about the actual core product. It's about what comes around it. What's that experience like? And uh, so customer experience is, is an important aspect of this. Um, and it's, but it's tapping into different segments, different individuals, and understanding what does that solution look like to them. So have you mapped out the, the customer scenarios? So which, what different ways could they go? And the last one down at the bottom here is where, does you, where do your customers get their money from? So typically, nobody's got money sitting around just to, to try out with different things. Most people are on a tight budget. Most organizations are on a tight budget. When you come up with a new idea uh, and you're trying to, to get people to buy it, that money is typically coming from somewhere else. So if in a business situation, it might be coming out from another vendor. It might be coming from internal um, in staffing costs. So it might be coming out of an advertising budget. It's, um, it's coming from somewhere. And somebody else is typically going to lose on that. So understand what the dynamics are in that situation, because these other parties can try and influence things a different direction. Know who you're up against. So for someone who has an idea and is ready to sort of start rolling with it, then I like to think about the first 90 days. Uh, there's accelerator programs around the world, and they're really focused around a tw uh, most of them are a 12-week format, so it's 84 days or 86 days in some of them, and it's really about focusing in on identifying the problem, coming up with a, a solution around that, and being able to present or pitch that at the end of 90 days. So in, a, in an accelerator or not, then it's still a really strong time to be able to focus on getting something together, and at the end of it, either being able to say, this has got legs, 
or being able to say, well, we've tried, this doesn't work. And failing after 90 days can, um, sometimes that's a better choice than trying to persist with things beyond uh, too long and getting yourself into financial difficulty. So what I like to encourage is a sort of a daily rhythm. So it's particularly, it's easier as a group or if you've got uh, peers around you, uh, and that's where a, spa uh, like a co-working space can become useful, um, or if you've got co-founders. So when you wake up in the morning, know what your assumptions are around the business. So, and have them out in the open, put them up on uh, cards up on the wall. Uh, make them visible, make them apparent. Work on solutions to, uh, to try and solve them. And keep them ordered. If, if you go and write up all the different sort of assumptions and uh, risks you've got around the business, then it's easy to get overwhelmed, there's too much to do. If you prioritise them in the order you need to work through them, it can help to focus. And maybe just focus today on one of these issues. So um, products, uh, things like tools like Jira or Kanban boards and things like that can help to, to really work well there. So the other aspect is that be focused in the morning and, and get regular daily progress. And so you get a sense that you're moving forward. Because typically you'll start out, you'll have an idea, you'll go out and talk to people and you'll need to evolve that. And, and the money just doesn't flow in from day one. If it does, you're probably on a very successful model and chances are things will scale ridiculously and you don't need a lot of these lessons. There's probably a handful of businesses in the world that have done that in the last five years. So this one's comp uh, around compounding learning. So I've got sales on one axis, I've got time on the other. So being a startup, revenue is important, making money is important. But what's really important is the learning that takes place at the very early stages of a business. Because what you're doing is you're laying the foundation for the growth stage that comes later on. Typically startups go through, uh, there's, so there's six stages. So the first one is around discovery and finding out around an idea. The second one is validating to test out if will, people will pay for it. There's a third stage which is uh, referred to as efficiency, which is a way of, of kind of tightening up things, tightening up the customer acquisition paths and the product delivery, those sorts of things. And then there's a scale stage. After that comes sustain, sustaining the business and decline. So what happens in here is very, very important as to how quickly you're learning, how quickly you're trying out things. Potentially you can rule out a whole bunch of possibilities that don't work. Ideally what you do is you learn a scalable way to grow the business through one of those growth engines. The risk is that it's not about failure at this point if you can find revenue, but what might happen is that you plateau out too early. And that's typically what happens around technology, small, uh, small technology businesses. The, uh, the, the, the unicorn club, the billion dollar tech startups that uh, often make the, the media, they're the ones who've been able to find a really scalable path to, to grow and, and start growing exponentially and then get their WhatsApp sort of valuations in the, the multiple billions. And don't say it can't happen in Canberra. So there is a, I think the, the biggest valuation seen in Canberra is four billion for a company for a period of time. So as far as business uh, startups go, there's really four types. Uh, this is particularly around uh, software, software startups. I haven't tested this out in, in other areas. Um, there's four types of startups. The first one is the automizer. And what that is, is a product like Google, Dropbox. Uh, it's basically something that consumers think is really cool um, and that they engage with because the product's just so sweet. Before Google came along, there was a bunch of search engines. And um, Google were able to do things in a way that was much better to engage with. Um, Eventbrite's another one. Again, people will engage with that because it's, uh, it's, it's doing things in an easier way. The second one down here is the social transformer. And this is a business with network effects. And um, one which um, you need to get a very uh, concentrated sort of uh, critical mass of people in a segment to really start to, to grow. And then potentially you can start to change the world. The third sort is an integrator. Typically, it's a, a big business offering for a small business. So uh, I've got Zendesk, which is a help desk tool. Uh, Reboard, which is a, a product I worked on a couple of years ago. Get Satisfaction, which is uh, around um, uh, customer satisfaction for websites. Typically, this is something that would normally be held, uh, a process which would be very expensive for a big company that can be sort of brought in so that any business uh, or like a freelancer, sole trader, can, can engage with the product and do it quite affordably. And the fourth one is around challenges, which is typically an enterprise challenger. Now, recognising what sort of business, what sort of uh, type of startup that you're looking at is crucial. There's a few reasons for that. The first one is the concept of scale time. 
This research was drawn by a company called Startup uh, Compass with their Startup Genome Report. And they surveyed about 6,000 companies to come up with this and looked at what, what created companies that succeeded uh, and what created ones which failed. And they found that typically for the ones that, that succeeded, that, that uh, the, the integrator was the quickest at 16 months to get to a scale stage if they made it through that first 16 months. And the challenger took the longest at 64 months. So if you've got an idea that's around um, challenging, say, SAP, Oracle, one of the, the incumbent enterprise technology companies, then expect to spend five to six years before you're ready to really ramp things up. So it's, it's, a, it's a long path. The other aspect is around the founding team. So you've got uh, technologists who can build stuff that's really awesome, and that includes uh, uh, technologists who work within user interface design. And then you've got the business side, which is understanding uh, business cases, business processes, business development, that side of things. So for something like an automizer, then you're looking at a uh, technology that's really easy to use. It's very, uh, makes, people enjoy using it. And technologists tend to come up with those solutions. Whereas the, the enterprise challenger is typically about understanding a business case, bringing in domain expertise, understanding what the business problems are, and being able to uh, draft out the, and do the business analysis, and then bring the technologists in later. The last lesson I wanted to share was around what you say when you've got a startup. The first thing is that as a startup, um, particularly if you're used to have, being in an environment with a lot of resources in a uh, uh, either a larger organisation or um, perhaps as a you've, you've had a, a more established small medium business, then you need to be very 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 focused with what you're starting with. So. When I hear entrepreneurs or um, intenders talk about, I want to do this and this as their business idea, or we're chasing this market or this market, I get a bit worried because it's not clear what they're going after. The important thing to do here is to start to look at what, which, ones, which, which is the highest priority to go after first. Uh, test that out, prove that it, it works or prove it doesn't work, and then move on to the next one. And do it sequentially. Don't go after everything at once. The other one is that when people are using maybe, I guess, uh, words of doubt, um, it doesn't present well. <laughs> so uh, that, again, just comes by practice and, and going through things. So I'm going to move on to Entry 29 co-working next. Before I do that, I just wanted to check if there are any questions around the previous slides. I'm happy to share them around if people are interested. So would you say when people startups tell you we want to do this first so that we can generate cash flow so that we can do what you really want to do. Do you hear that often? So the question was uh, that about entrepreneurs who want to do say consulting services uh, first or do something something else so they can get the money so they can focus on what they really want to focus on. So I do hear that and generally they keep staying on making the money through uh, through services income. And that's, that's a, a personal choice. As far as what I say to that, then I try to, I like to get them thinking about how they might start to automate certain components of their business process, perhaps the lower value ones, through either outsourcing or automating, so that potentially they can start to d develop an, um, a semi-automated workflow and then try and start to productize that as they go. Um, because it, otherwise, it's too attractive to stay focused on the, the services income. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about Entry 29 co-working. Where this is relevant is the, with, with, particularly with startups, there's a lot of, really, uh, typically people will do it alone or in small teams, and they don't know who to talk to about things. And, Entry 29 was really set up as a way for innovators, for entrepreneurs, uh, to come together and provide a place to talk about these types of things on a regular basis. So, for example, um, so for example, the other day there was, at Entry 29 we had a lunch um, and had a, a bunch of people around the table and we started talking around that that R, the R model, the uh, this one here, in regards to some business ideas. And as we we're going through it, then. Uh, the, the person who brought up the idea could start to see where they needed to focus. And that was just over lunch. Every day there's a whole bunch of conversations taking place. So Entry 29 was set up for that purpose and the way it came about was 
uh, having an idea and getting a whole bunch of people to come and work on the space. So if, for those of you not familiar, Intertwee 9 is based in the city, uh, in Acton, on, in Childers Street. And it's a demandable building that was covered with graffiti, uh, rough floor, that sort of thing. And a bunch of the entrepreneurial community came together, uh, including many people in this uh, several people in this room, to fit the place out. Um, and a lot of us didn't have experience in doing certain things uh, with certain tools, painting, that sort of thing. So the, the community came together to create this space. And today we've got a workspace where people come in, bring their computers in, and can start to work. And it's not just sort of tech startups, there's freelancers, there's people working in uh, usability. Uh, there, some people are in there just casually, some people are in there full time. Um, so there's around about 50 members um, full at the moment. We've had about um, a little over 100 sign up. Some people don't last the distance, they, they come in with an idea, they start up, they don't make it through and they go and grab a job somewhere and that's, uh, that's part of what happens, but in the process they get to share their lessons with others. That's a way of retaining that knowledge and hopefully they'll come back at some point with their next idea. So the other thing that Entry 29 is, is about is a way, place for people to come together for events. This photo here, uh, sorry about the, the quality of it, this is from the Hacked Hackathon that was held uh, in December. Uh, Matt Stimson, who's the Entry 29 Community Manager, uh, organised this hackathon in 30 days. Um, a little bit of help, but brought together, filled, the, filled out the entire place. Um, it was sold out within about, I think, uh, 25 days or something like that. And basically, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of people coming together to spend a weekend coding away, uh, developing ideas, doing digital art to come up and present businesses, uh, business ideas or projects uh, to, um, to, uh, to a pitch panel and also to a, a, an audience of about 90. The plan this year is to have a uh, game jam, have a creative. Um, uh, in May, and also looking at working with uh, uh, GovHack as well this year. Uh, if you've got ideas for cool events and looking for an awesome place to hold it, then um, have a chat to me afterwards. Um, and then my details, if you want to, if you want to keep in touch. The uh, 40 residents in the in the main area, so we can fit probably we could we squeeze 50 in for the hackathon. We're fitting out a second room, which is 150 square meters. Um, and so that's going to boost the, the, the numbers we can have. They'll probably be used more for events, um, but that's going to be probably another 40. So we're looking at about 90 for the, um, assuming everything sort of falls in place, 90 for that event. Uh, there's enough in Sydney already. The, con the concept for this, uh, we tapped into Fish Burners, which is a co-working space in Sydney, and um, we got advice from them. They also helped with the founder, how things were set up. They are not for profit, as are we, and uh, we've got close links there. So members will go up there or come down here. We also have uh, linked up with River City Labs up in Brisbane, which is a little bit more orientated towards mobile games. Um, that's a for profit model, but again, they've got ideas they can feed into things. There's a, a, a big co-working network around Australia of uh, similar sort of spaces. So any other questions? So happy to speak afterwards with people. I'd like to thank you all for uh, watching me talk about startup lessons and entry 29.